Okay, we are back in Genesis, uh, now looking at Genesis chapter 4. We have already covered the creation in seven days, and the second accounting of creation in Genesis 2. It focuses on the Garden of Eden, setting up the uh, parameters for everything, such as um, the very purpose that God uh, put the man in the garden, his purpose, and the purpose of the woman that he made. If you remember what they were, what, was the, what did God put the man in the garden to do? In the garden. Yeah, he, his job is to work and to keep that garden. It's been planted by the Lord, and his job is uh, to keep it up, uh, to take care of it. But he needs a helper. And so that's what the Lord makes the woman for, to be his helper. And he has the angelic host there, seraphim and cherubim, who cherubim specifically, who are given the job to guard and to protect not to keep those things that would be off limits. And when we get to Genesis 3, we find that everyone has rebelled against their duties. Uh, the, the, the cherubim, the, the, ser the serpent, uh, who is a cherub in the garden, uh, instead of guarding the way, he opens the door uh, to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and um, tempts them to take that which is forbidden. And the woman, instead of helping the man, is the one who hands him the fruit, becomes his greatest temptation, and hands him the forbidden fruit, and she betrays her calling. Um, and the man, same thing, who is supposed to be in charge of the place, uh, is completely silent during the whole process, does nothing, and just stands by and lets it all unfold. Everyone has failed in their duties and brings upon the curse. Um, we last left them off, if you remember. Um, in Genesis chapter 3. How does Genesis chapter 3 end? After the fall, after God curses them. If you remember, how does the chapter end before we head off? Doesn't he give them hope? Mm hmm And what are the signs of hope that he gives them? Well, he covers, covers them with skins, for one thing. Yeah, yeah. The first thing is he gives them proper clothing, right? We go down to the end of chapter 3. Um, it says that uh, verse 20, there's a couple things. The first sign of hope is the man finally gives his wife a name. And he names her Eve because she was the mother of all living. Again, a sign of hope as he's looking forward, even though death has come into the world, yet uh, there is Eve through whom there will be life. Uh, and then the Lord, as you mentioned, Rob, makes garments of skin for them. What, what's the significance of that? Uh, and making skins garments for them blood had to be shed an animal had to be killed to get the skins yeah yeah it's a beautiful picture of a covering of their sin remember the first thing they noticed when they sinned was that they were naked their shame is exposed and they we mentioned the horrible just the worst things you could use is fig leaves to to cover yourself here um and the Lord provides proper covering of them, which comes at the at the death of an animal. Of a some an animal has to die. Foretelling, you can see the gospel unfolding for them. Um, and then uh, to further, um, as an act of grace, I would say He keeps them from eating the tree of life and living forever. I'm going to ask you a question. Why, why might that be considered an act of kindness and grace to not allow them to eat from the tree of life? Because they live with sin for the rest of their life. Yeah. Yeah. You, when you, to, to live, it'd be like the walking dead. You would, to live with sin for eternity is an, is a, is an awful thing. And so the Lord, out of his mercy, um, holds off. He doesn't destroy the tree of life. He just guards it and takes it from them. And if you remember when we went through Revelation, it will return. It will return at the end once sin is atoned for in the new heavens and the new earth. All right, so that's where we left off. And now we enter some of the dramas here. But I want to remind you of one more thing here that's going to be sort of the theme for things coming up. Let's read this one more time. Um, this is Genesis 3, 14 and 15, the curse of the serpent. And that sort of informs uh, the, the the struggles that are going to ensue in the in the book of Genesis. So, uh, Bob uh, Bob Thomas, would you uh, read that for us? For chapter three, fourteen, and fifteen. Yep. 
The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Um, he, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Yeah. Uh, that verse there, I think, is is really key uh, to helping us understand the stories, the narratives that unfold, especially in Genesis. There's now a, a battle uh, on earth now between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. And so you're going to see many battles like this where, uh, where two forces, two people, two groups are uh, at odds with one another, they are, and one is the aggressor, one is the violent one, and and one is the sort of the innocent, more passive one, and uh, and you're going to see the battle unfold where the the one representing the serpent, the aggressor, the one who will attack and bruise the heel, uh, will strike the one who was the gentle one, the lowly one, who is of the woman, of the of the character of the woman um who who will be bruised but in the end he will rise victorious in the end of it when it talks about the offspring of the serpent is he talking about the other uh other fallen angels no he's not um so again we, we talk about offspring or children of something uh ch children uh well in, in one sense the answer to the question is yes kind of but not, but not only that. So uh, the children of something is, is anything, is not just that which comes by blood, but that which shares the same nature and aims as the original. Well, that's why I was thinking the other, uh, the other fallen angels, because they're not his blood. The yeah. Satan, Satan yeah. doesn't have children per se, but yeah, exactly right. I think so. I think let me, let me correct myself there. Yeah, I think you're right. That 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 is that is included in it. But also, uh, people are included in that too. Uh, remember, Jesus says that the Pharisees were their father was the devil, right? Uh, because they shared his. They he was a murderer, and they're murderers. Um, and so he's a, he's a liar. They're liars. And and we're children of Abraham. We don't have a drop of his blood in us, uh, but we share his faith. We have the faith of Abraham. Okay. So um, let's move down to this next. This is the first, uh, you could say this is the first battle in this long war um, between two brothers, a story we know well. And uh, let's go read through it and kind of catch up some of the details here. So uh, Claudette, would you start us off here? Verses one to uh, seven. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at this passage here. Um, so we first have this uh, Adam, it says, knew his wife, and she conceived. Okay. And her name, she calls him Cain. What does the name Cain mean? Does anyone have a note on that? Gotten. Mine says gotten. Gotten, yeah. G-O-T-T-N? G-O-T-T-E-N, yes. Okay, gotten is what... Yeah, mine, mine says, I have produced. I have produced. That's a little bit 
More produce. So I have produced means Kane. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So I have produced. Uh, okay. And then we'll add with the help of the Lord. And so right there, you see uh, something interesting is when you see people say, saying things uh, with direct quotes, it's it's expressing something more. I mean, there's this, what, what is, when she says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord, what does that mean? The baby was sent to her by God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the help of the Lord, she, I mean, she could have easily have said, you know, it's obvious. We know some biology here. It was the help of Adam that, uh, that gets her pregnant um but she's attributing this to the lord this is this is this is a uh eve is expressing faith here um in the lord i mean she sees that cain has come to her from the lord so there's um that's a hopeful thing i mean that when, when anybody kind of invokes the name of the lord that's that's nothing to sneeze at that's actually a, a big deal when when the scriptures record them saying things like that so eve is presented as someone who's having faith in the lord here um and what do we learn about and then she, later on she will put his name now what does abel's name mean i have it means breath vapor or nothing which the connotation of perishable yeah it's a somber prophecy of what follows yeah his his name really is uh He's a breath. He's a vapor. Um, you don't. I mean, this is the only scene you have of Cain, of Abel, and he's gone. But let's talk a little bit about Cain, and what's said about Cain from the beginning here. What is the first thing we're told about him? That he works the fields. All right. So he is a worker of the ground. Now, what do we know about the ground? So for at this point in history, they came, came from, from the dirt. dirt. Mm -hmm. it, it's been cursed. Yeah, Adam came from the ground. And the ground has been cursed. So just a thought about that. The, the um, animals also came from the ground, didn't they? Yes, yes um we'll add that in there adam and the animals came from the ground but the ground has been cursed so we'll keep that in mind he's a worker of the ground um and what what does he do in the course of time now so when we think about in the course of time this could be a couple hundred years i mean there's no there's no timing of this people wonder where cain got his wife later on as if Adam and Eve only had two kids. Um, we're told that they had many sons and daughters. And so they're only they're only referencing two. We don't even know if Cain and Abel were the first two. Um, just but these are the two that are recognized for us. Eve would have given birth to many, many more children. They would have had children. So there's a lot of people in the world. And when that simple phrase in the course of time means we're talking many years later uh, again it could easily be a couple hundred years later for all we know um, but in any case in the course of time what happens here cain does what he made an offering of of his pro his plants that he grew so cain brought to the lord okay that's good an offering so this is at least on the right path there um but what was the offering of, of, of the fruit of the ground? Okay. And that's all we're told. Um, I think once we see Abel's offering, we begin to understand what might be wrong with Cain's offering. So let's look at Abel. What is Abel, we're told? What's well, the first thing? What's the his first job? One. Of his flock. Okay, well, what's his job? Oh, he's a shepherd. Yeah, he's a keeper of sheep. Okay. Um, you'll notice, um, even from the beginning, the way things are described, 
Abel job description is similar to Adam's original job description, which was to keep the garden. To keep it's been given to him and he just keeps it. Uh, Cain's description is more like Adam's job description after the curse, where he has to work the ground. You got to work it now. Um, it's it's not going to come easy for you. It's not it's the grace is not there. But Abel comes, he's a keeper of sheep, and when he he brings an offering for the Lord, right? And what does he bring? Abel um, brought to the Lord what? The firstborn of the lamb. Um, the firstborn of his flock. Yeah. And was that the fat? Of their fat portions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's the significance of that? Of the firstborn of the flock and their fat portions let's let's here's the question is why is abel's offering better than cain's i mean abel's for, is a foreshadowing of what's going to have the passover with the jews and jesus being you know the lamb of god mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah, let's start with that. So Abel's is a blood offering, which, as you know, um, is acknowledging uh, the curse and sin <clears throat> and covering it. Okay, so that's I, the I think I think Hebrews uh, somehow Abel had faith behind his offering. Yeah, who says and Cain didn't because I, it's true that it was a blood offering, but there was a prescription in, in the law for grain offerings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in and of itself, the fact that that Cain brought a grain offering, I mean, wouldn't be the end of the world. It was not a problem, not not necessarily a problem, although I think there were ways that the grain offering had to be brung. I can't remember. Um I have to look into that more carefully, but yeah, there, there is the, the first thing you notice is it is a different kind of offering. Mm -hmm. um, Abel is is shedding blood, and uh, and Cain is bringing fruit. But I mean, you could all if you looked at it from their point of view. Uh, I mean, just on what we have already, it, it looks like they're both bringing offerings of what you know of what they've produced or what their you know right. what their job is that. They're taking some of the best of what they have. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look at that then. So the, the, there are two two very important things to say about why Abel's offering is better. Um, the first thing, uh, what, what's why why is that offering better than Cain's? So uh, the firstborn. Was firstborn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Abel's is the firstborn. Yeah. It's probably presumed to be without spot or blemish because it's just been born yeah okay um why why is that that i think that's one of the most significant part being the firstborn um so what does that mean he's giving the firstborn of the flock top he's of the line to god before he keeps for himself yeah he's he's really he's he's putting god first and it's an act of trust because think about it you're you're as a shepherd you don't there's no guarantee that 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 you is going to have more babies more more lambs and when you get that first one that's an exciting moment and you're giving it to the lord and is is a really an act of faith because you don't know if if she's going to have any more after that um, and so to give him from the top there, whereas as as Abel, he just gives some of the fruit of the ground, I think it says, right? And so it's just, it seems to be more of a sampling or just more of a, uh, maybe the leftovers or whatever. But uh, but Abel is really commended for that. It's the firstborn. It's really an act of trust. He's trusting, trusting the Lord to provide for him. So it's the difference between, you know, um, giving the Lord, the first portion of your paycheck versus whatever's left over at the end of the week. And there's a big difference between the two. One is an act of faith, trusting the Lord to take care of you. 
um, when you honor him with the first fruits. And the other is just, uh, you know, well, let's see how it goes. And then we'll give him whatever's left over, uh, which is not so uh, such an act. But there's something else about the, the firstborn here. He does mention as well with that offering. It's the fat portions. Yeah, what's the significance of the fat portions? Isn't that, well, fat, somebody in those days was fat, was considered to be prosperous and good and healthy and robust. Yeah, the fatty portions yeah. is the best part. I mean, that's that's really considered the the the, the best part of the uh, of the lamb. So Abel's uh, is the best of what he has. Hello, Teresa. Hi. So um, Cain again. I think Cain is more condemned for what is not said about his offering. That there doesn't seem to be anything special about it. Um, all right. Now, now the big test comes because Cain has not, Cain has not sinned yet, or at least the, the conflict hasn't risen just yet. But but what do we have here? What's what's going on? So the the it says here, uh, the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but not for Cain. So the Lord is not impressed with Cain's offering and has little regard for it. Um, and the response now is where we get into the issue here. Uh, Cain's response. Well, he was he was not remorseful. He was angry. Yeah. Instead of being apologetic or, or remorseful, he was like what I'm not good enough and he stopped probably stopped off yeah what what does his face fell mean he was envious he was disappointed yeah yeah uh, disappointed is a good word uh he's disappointed and he's angry and well, that may be a better maybe like frustrated face fell, fall in his face, um, a little bit of shame as well Shame? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Is there a, um, let me see if I can find another definition, another version of it. Anybody have a different? Just thinking a child, if their face falls, they're usually ashamed or recognizing they've done wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, let me just do a quick, see how some of the other uh, versions interpret that phrase. I'll look at the New Living Translation real quick. Um, and it says, and he, he is that this made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, his face fall, he's, he's frustrated. He's maybe feeling sorry for himself or he's just, he's in a bad mood. I think that we could safe to say that. Um, the Lord's response to Cain is very interesting. Uh, the Lord's response now, what does he say? Well, why are you why are you angry? Why and why has your confidence fallen? Yeah, why are you angry? And you know, frustrated or distressed or whatever it is. Why why are you feeling that way? And he says something interesting. He says, um, "If you do well, will you not be accepted?" What does that mean? If you will do if you do well, will you not be accepted? It's interesting. The NASB says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Ah. Okay. Um, you know, basically, yeah, if if you do do what's right. Uh, so basically, I would put it this way: get, get this offering right. He's giving him a chance here to fix this problem here. Get this offering right. And, um, you know, things will go well. You will do well, right? It, it's it's gonna. It's, I'll put it this way: all will be okay. If, if you just just do, get it right. Learn from this. I mean, this is it's kind of one of those things. Like you're, um, if you're a coach and you're 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 you're, you're 
you know, you're dealing with little kids and they're up there and they're striking out all the time and they're frustrated and angry every time they strike out, but you know, they're holding the bat upside down. They're holding their, their hands are all wrong and they're just doing everything wrong. And they're getting more and more angry and frustrated and say, look, listen, if you do right, you'll, it will work for you. And doing right means you need to listen to me and let me show you how to do this. Take some instruction. Now, at this point, um, what should Cain do at this point? If he wanted to do right and get this right, what should he do? Ask God what he wants him to do. Yeah. Ask, ask God what he wants him to do. Yep, yeah, that's one, one way. Um, one of the things I see here is that anger is an emotion. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of that paragraph, it says you must rule over it. So it's like control yourself, rule over your emotions. Yeah, he describes it as the sin crouching at your door. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that sin that is, this is another, this is the devil's brew here. Keep this in mind. This is the serpent now coming the devil crouches at your door like a lion waiting to devour you the serpent crouching ready to strike waiting for the right moment and um it's it, it is a call back to that and yeah his anger and his frustration here and are going to be big in this so but but one of the things that that if he really wanted to do this right other than God, who should he go and talk to? Abel. Abel. Abel got it right. Abel did everything right, and the Lord was pleased with him. And if Cain wanted to do it right, he should go to his younger brother and learn from him. Well, good luck with that. But that's that's the, this is the rub here. It's, mm, this, is, this is the moment, and why would Cain not do that? Why would Cain not? Pride. Go? Yeah, isn't it? It's pride. And so you see that. Now we see this. Okay, so when the Lord says the warning, this is the Lord's warning. Is this sin is crouching at the door. And it says desire is contrary to, or its desire is to rule you, or its desire is for you. Basically, what did he do that was so bad, Pastor? Say that again. What did he do that was so bad? Cain hasn't done anything that was so bad. It's just that his offering was not acceptable. It was a, you know, Abel's offering was a was of blood it was the firstborn it was the best uh that was abel's offering cain's offering is he's working the cursed ground there's no there's no blood offering for sin mentioned at all for him and he's just bringing an offering of the fruit of the ground it's yeah. nothing it's nothing special that's the that's the issue is it's nothing special now god so is this, oh, this isn't god, that way oh sorry sorry let me just finish that point so god is not um punishing Cain here he's just simply saying that the the his offering is just it's not good enough it's not acceptable and so he doesn't punish him for that in fact he gives him instructions now so and you know don't be and and Cain is angry because he's not getting the reward he wants he wants some kind of regard some kind of blessing in some maybe there's some physical way that God showed his uh pleasure with Abel's offering that he didn't do with Cain's. Cain is angry and frustrated. The Lord is not punishing him. He's just not accepting it. He said, look, I'm sorry. It's kind of like, look, if, if you go to the store and want to buy, you know, a car or whatever, and you only have $100, they're going to say, look, no car for you. We don't, we don't sell cars that cheap, right? We're not punishing you. We're just saying that's not good enough. Not good enough. So he gives and, him the warning. But, but Claudette, you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was I was just thinking that um that really the the offering is like a form of worship, right? So it's like when we pray in the morning, we do adoration. We we say prayer of worship and praise, and we try and we, I think we all do it very heartfelt. 
Yeah. But it's like people who who worship the Lord say words that come out of their mouth of worship, but it's not heartfelt. Yeah. It's just they're going through the motions. Yeah. So yeah. it's like Cain was just going through the motions of offering what he had to offer, but but Abel did it and it was heartfelt. It was he was really worshiping the Lord with all he had. Yeah. So it, it'd be like this if it was uh I don't know if it's your anniversary, Teresa and Jack. It's let's say your anniversary is coming up, and and Jack, you would never do this, but let's uh -oh. say you forgot the anniversary, and you just rushed off to the store last second and found, grabbed a card off the shelf, didn't even look at it, signed your name to it here, you know, here, honey, and it's a uh, you actually grabbed a happy birthday card instead. And, um, I was thinking a sympathy you know, card. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Teresa, when you open that. Are you thinking, oh, how sweet, right? <laughs> you know, you're probably thinking, not good enough, pal. <laughs> not good enough. And it's not, it's not the, it's not the gift itself. It's the thought. You know that he was the 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 what was wrong with it was the thoughtlessness that he wasn't thinking about you, and so he just throws something together. Um, I mean, if if you were on a tight budget and all he could afford was a card and that's all they had was a birthday card and he scratched it out and you knew all that that you would that would be acceptable because the thought was there um so you that's have just gotten me in trouble oh i'm sorry <laughs> so you did send him a birthday card on your anniversary the truth comes out <laughs> <laughs> all right so sin sin is crossing the door and his desire is for you but he says but you must rule over it all right pastor is that I won't say a reflection of, but but um, going to what Paul said with, I do what I, I don't want to do. I don't do what I want to do. It is something to that. Yeah, because he does. Remember the specific, specific sin in Romans 7 that Paul gives an example that convicts him. Do you remember what it was? I don't. It was a, the law. Covetous, covetousness. Covetousness. Thou shalt not covet. Right. So. There's another one too uh, in James where it says, uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's important to get is the devil. What is the devil all about? You know, a lot of people think that the devil is all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And that's not the case. That's the lust of the flesh. That's something different. The devil is, is a different form of evil. And his evil, as you mentioned already, look at look at the look at what Cain is dealing with here. He's not dealing with lusts. It's not like Esau, who sells his birthright for a bowl of soup. What is Cain dealing with right now? The first word that came to your mind when you read the story. What's what's Cain dealing? What is his sins? What's his temptation right now? Is envy absolutely covetousness? Envy. We'll call it uh, bitter envy. And there's another one, pride. With it, and pride, and selfish ambition. This is what James calls the wisdom of the demons. Mm -hmm. They're driven by bitter envy and selfish ambition, or we would call pride and bitterness, pride and envy. This is the devil's brew, which is why uh, the those who share in the devil's sins of pride and envy, those are the ones who become the murderers. Why do people murder? Why do they do this? Uh, is it often specifically, it's typically because there's a bitterness toward the other person, an envy of them, or a bitterness in some way, or, or pursuing a selfish, ambitious gain over this. Uh, you become like an animal. You become like a serpent on the road, a beast, when you have this. <laughs> And this is what this is the temptation. And now the 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 challenge for Cain is what will he do? Will he resist the devil, resist his own envy and bitterness and selfish ambition, and humble himself and turn with a soft heart and learn from his brother? That's a hard thing to do for an older brother to learn from a younger brother. I, I think if, I think most of us could admit we've had a Cain-like moments in that um when we do something for God, yeah. no matter what it is, or even if we give money or we do whatever and things in life do not go well, yeah, uh, we are ticked off at God. Yeah. 
we've done something for you and what have I got? Can't expect something. Yeah. It's like yeah. we expect something in those situations. Like he somehow owes us something. He's indebted to us because of yeah. what we've done for him. And Cain feels disenfranchised. He feels the victim. Um, this is why this whole, why I can't stand the woke ideology uh, that is so prevalent among our young people today is because it promotes victimhood. Mm-hmm. Everyone's a victim. And that is the devil. That's what the devil does. The devil thinks himself a victim. Mm-hmm. You know, he really does. He believes he's been cheated, that God has not been fair to him. He's been cheated and he's driven by a bitterness. And so all these groups that they are appealing to, the LGBTQ, the, the, the racial injustice, all those things, it's like they're driving people to think of themselves as victims and feeding their bitterness and envy and their selfish ambition. And it's, it's, an, ooh, it's an awful thing. It's an awful thing. And it has to be resisted. You can't flee from it. You have to resist it. Uh, you can flee the you, you can flee the lust. You can flee the drugs. You can run away from drugs. You can run away from sex, and all kinds of things like that. But you cannot run away from pride and bitter envy. You have to resist it and humble ourselves with it. So that's Cain's challenge. Um, well, doesn't turn out too well for him, does it? So let's take a look. Doesn't this remind you of Esau and Jacob in a way? Oh, Esau was the older. Yep. Jacob was the younger. Jacob got was the, the one that got the birthright from from uh, yep. his Isaac, and mm-hmm. Esau wanted to kill Jacob. Yep. Joseph and his brothers, same thing. Even Ishmael and Isaac have moments like that too. I mean, this this is this is a this is a common theme that you're going to see again and again. This is the serpent, the son of the serpent, and the son of the woman. So let's let's go pick it up from here. Um, Let's see, where do we leave off here? Rob, uh, Roy, um, let's do, um, I don't know, let's go verses uh, eight to 12. Let's do that. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, "Where where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. You know, I think I'm going to call this section the fall of Cain. Um, the devil has come to him just like he did. The serpent has come to him just like he did to Eve and Adam. Um, and he does not resist him as he's supposed to. He does not rule over him. Um, and so what happens with him? The uh, first thing that happens, he says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. What does that mean? Spoke to him. What do you think? Him. What's that? He, con- he confronted him. Is it that what he does? He confronts him? Um, Try to kill him? So, yeah, that's the question. Is what does he say to him? Is it a confrontation with him? Um, him. Say it again? Maybe he's trying to console him. Uh, that Abel's trying to console Cain? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't know exactly what, what was said here. Um, so is... So is is uh, Cain confronting Abel? Uh, is so in my end, it's uh, it says Cain said to his brother Abel, "Let's go out in the field." When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, and Abel killed him. Oh, interesting. There is a footnote there. Let me see if I got that. That that sounds like he schmoozed them into the field. It was the setup. It's a setup. He deceives him. Hey, let's go out in the field, brother. He spoke to his brother. And in some of the versions, it says, let us go out to the field. All right, we'll go with that. That seems to make some sense. Um, 
it doesn't say in the in the ESV here, but in the other ones it does. So Cain spoke to his brother. Um, let me see. And we're going to go with some of the versions. Say, let us go out. So he lures him out to the field. So he gets him away. Because remember, there's lots of people around. It's not, it's not just the two of them. There are a lot of other people living right now. And uh, to, to get him away. Um, and so when he has him away out of sight, it says, what does he do? Um, Cain rose up and killed Abel. That's all it says. We don't, we're not told how he does it. I guess rose up, maybe hit him, I'm assuming, with a club or a rock or something. But uh, he rises up and kills Abel. All right. The Lord now speaks to Cain. And we'll call this, uh, so, so just like he did, you'll notice it's similar in format to the fall of Adam and Eve. There's the forbidden action. And then the Lord begins with a question. Mm. What's the Lord's question? What have you done? Uh, well, before that. Uh, where is Abel, your brother? Where is Abel, your brother? Is that, is that familiar to you? Yeah, where are you? Oh, where <laughs> where are, you? are you? Right. That's exactly what he said to Adam. Where are you? You're hiding. Okay. Where is Abel, your brother? What are you hiding here? Um. And Interesting, because sur surely God knows in both instances what had happened. Yep, yep, <laughs> and he makes it clear he does. Cain's response is what? Uh, Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, it's a, just a denial. Um, he lies. I mean, I don't know. He knows exactly where his brother is. Um, I don't know. And then that whole thing, am I my brother's keeper? Not my turn to watch him. <laughs> yeah. am I, am I, do, uh, you know the significance of my brother's keeper there? Why he, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a play on words here. If you know, if you caught the, in the context of the story. Because he was, he was meant to keep the garden. Adam was meant to keep the garden, but he talks about his brother's keeper. What is... What is Abel's job? Shepherd. But he doesn't he describe him as a shepherd. He describes him as a keeper of sheep. You know, so it's like, you know, Abel's a keeper of sheep. He's, he's, that's the one thing about the, the, the nature of their jobs, too, is very different. In, in Abel's job as a keeper of sheep, he's, he has concern and protects and cares and provides for these living creatures. Adam has no... I mean, not Adam McCain is he's a worker of the field. He has no attachment to the field, no attachment to anything he's given here. That's another part of Abel's sacrifice that's significant. For a shepherd to give up one of his sheep is a big deal. Um, it would be like sacrifice if you if you were a dog lover and sacrificing one of your puppies to the Lord, that's a pretty emotional thing. This is not a mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Um, and I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Remember, uh, just a little note there that uh, Abel was a keeper of sheep, uh, unlike Cain, who is just a cruel man. It, it makes me think of, uh, I'm probably, I might not get the names right, but, but is it Sapphira and her husband that sold the land and gave part of the money and said it was all? Yeah. Uh, and the thing that, that makes me think of that is the fact that in their case, they didn't understand who God really was, that he knows everything. Mm. And so they're trying to hold, uh, pull something over him. In this case, Cain's doing the same thing. Uh, it, yeah. It's like if, if, if you understood who God was, you'd know that he already knows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I want to see. I want you to see, though, that that Cain is, um, 
there's a coldness about Cain that's frightening in this response. Um, whereas Adam and Eve like felt shame. You don't get any sense of shame with Cain. He's like a psychopath. Yeah. There's no sense of remorse or shame about what has happened here. You know, Adam and Eve, they're, they, they at least acknowledge that something they did was wrong um, and they put blame on other people. Uh, but, you know, Cain's response is so cold. It's like, you know, he lies to the Lord himself. I don't know. My, my brother's keeper, and then throws out that line. Um, and so the Lord's second question is what? What have you done? What have you done? What have you done? Not really much of a question because he doesn't give him a chance to answer it. Um, and now comes... Uh, the voice of your brother's blood. What does that mean? The voice of Abel's blood is crying to me from the ground. Huh. What's the, what does that mean? What is the voice crying? What is it saying? What's going on here? I'm trying to think of the word I want to use. I want to say personification, but I don't want to use personification. Yeah, it is a personification. It is a, yeah, personification, I think is right. Um, that the blood is um, being portrayed as if it has a voice. Hmm. But what what is that afraid? What does that really mean that Abel's blood is crying to me from the ground? It doesn't just go away. I mean, God remembers his people. Uh, yeah. The thought that I, you, that Cain could do this criminal act and somehow God would just blow it off. He, just like we talked about in Revelation, he forever stands by his people, yeah. Yeah. including Abel in this situation. Yeah, what, what is, if, if, the, if, the, if Abel had a voice here crying from the ground, what would it be crying out to the Lord for? Vengeance. Vengeance, Vengeance. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Crying out for justice, vengeance. Kind of like the fifth seal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this, this, by the way, this passage is referenced in Hebrews, where it says that uh, that the blood of Jesus yep. speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Right. You know, so abel's blood cries out for justice and vengeance what does christ's blood cry out for mercy mercy and grace right uh that's that's the better word is mercy that blood jesus blood when it's shed uh cries out for mercy for the ones who shed it uh abel's rightly cries out for justice it's uh, funny you, that that's an interesting take in that passage uh another take i saw was that the the blood that that Abel offered in his animal sacrifice was inferior to Christ's blood. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I wrestled with that passage. I did some digging on it. I didn't know what it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's the, the it's a better word. It speaks about it as a better word than the blood of Abel, which is a uh, Abel's blood is personified as having a voice, speaking a word. Um. All right, let's take a look here. Um, what's the punishment? Uh, uh, Cain is, the, uh, the ground is cursed and he's cursed. I mean, he's, uh, he is ejected from uh, society in a sense. <laughs> well, not, not, actually not society, but let's take a look. He says, you are cursed from the ground. It'll so, be much diff more difficult to uh, have a garden now to produce uh, crops. It'll be even, even beyond that, even beyond that. Look what it says. Verse 12. It's already difficult to produce crops. Yes. Okay. The, the ground will no longer yield to you. So it won't just it, it won't just be weeds. It's just not going to produce. Yeah, basically, Cain will never survive as a farmer. 
It will never, the ground will not, anything he plants will die. All the, any work that he does will be fruitless. It will be, it will end in death. It will never work. He won't be able to, he will, you know, I don't know. What do they call that? Some people have a green thumb. What's the opposite of a green thumb? Black thumb. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I call it a black thumb. You kill it. Black thumb. Basically anything you're doing, just, it's like the reverse Midas touch. Anything you touch just dies. Um, and it's just, it's, he, he's cursed from the ground. He will never, the, the one thing that he has done all his life that he knows how to do, he can never do anymore. It will never work for him. He can no longer work the ground. Um, it's so much great. You'll notice that uh, this punishment is greater than, he says, he says uh, a punishment greater Then I can, but, but I have to pull back for a second. If Cain can no longer, the, the ground will not yield to him any longer. He says, what will become of him then in verse 12? Fugitive and a wanderer. Cain will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So he will be cast off i mean he's basically he's going to be roaming looking for work or whatever it's going to be but he will no longer be able to to live on a plot of land and to have a home um because the ground he is he is he's he's broken faith and he's is cursed from the ground now pain uh this we'll call this um uh, call it the mercy of the Lord on him too. Cain says something here. What does he say in verse? Let's read that. I guess 13 down to 16. Um, Jack, would you get that for us? Cain said to the Lord. Let me make it bigger for you. Okay. Nope. What the heck. I don't know why it does that to me. It just kind of jumps. Cain said to the Lord. And I think right there. Got it. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold and the lord shall put a mark on cain lest anyone who found him should attack him then cain went away from the presence of the lord and settled in the land of nod east of eden okay all right this whole thing is so fascinating that god allows them to live in the garden and then protects them and then protects them from yeah. others yeah, it's you really come away feeling that God is so patient and kind, even to someone so wicked as Cain. Um, he says, "My punishment is greater than I can bear." Why? Why is it so hard for him? Because he can no longer work the garden when he has to leave it. Okay, he is. To, first off, he's going to be you know driven away from the ground, right? And he gives another reason. Uh, is, is if he, he's a homeless now, he's homeless. Um, they will kill me. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Yeah, here's a question for you. Why? Well, if they're the siblings, they haven't been banished from, from the area. Mm -hmm. um, I always took it to me when he said they, that there were other humanoid, humanoid um, out there on the earth, you know, the, the Neanderthals, the Denisons, and some of these. So I always took it that yeah. those would be the ones that would kill them. Yeah, but that would not be correct. Now, Charles Darwin would agree with you on that one. <laughs> uh, but we, we don't we don't go that way because the, the Bible's clear again that Adam and Eve have many children. And this happened, this whole event happened in the course of time, perhaps a long time afterwards so the, the place there's a lot of people on the earth right now and if you're 
if your whole business is of producing children and God gives you the grace to do it, you know, even by today's standards, you can have a child a year if that's what your business is. And if he enables Eve to continue having children um, and then her children have children, you know, it, it, it doesn't take that long. It could take, you know, in 20 years, you've got 20 kids. Um, and let's say a good five of those 20 kids are able to have kids of their own too. And now you, you start multiplying and, and dividing and you end up with a lot of people on the earth. And they're all related, of course. They're all part of the same family. And do you think that someone like an Abel would have friends? I, I suspect that there were a lot of people that loved Abel, that would have loved him. I mean, he seems like a stand-up guy. Um, he is a keeper of sheep, and he's out there, but he, his, miss, his being missing would have become known. I mean, he'd be their uncle. Well, their father, their grandfather, or... their brother, their uncle, he might have had, he probably had kids too, for all we know. Right. They were no, we, we don't know. But there, but there certainly would have been an avenger of blood. That's the thing. In, in the Old Testament, there was this thing, person called the avenger of blood. Do you remember this in the, in the law? Yeah. That if someone committed murder, right. there would be a, a close relative who would be considered the avenger of blood, who would have the right to go after that person and kill them and uh, execute judgment against them. And then the city's a refuge if they, yep. were, they were innocent and all that stuff. Yeah, and so now they could flee to a city of refuge so that they could get a court case. Um, but if they didn't, then that person has the right. It, it's kind of like the old West where you get these bounty hunters wanted dead or alive and you go and find them and kill them. And they deserve to be killed. That's the, that's the thing. It's like they, they've committed murder Cain deserves to be killed. And he knows that if he's if he has to run from his home now and wander off as a fugitive and he can't he can't be self-sufficient anymore, well, he's going to have to be interacting with people and they guarantee you someone is out there is going to kill him um, because of what he did. That's that's how the it's, it's like the Wild West before the law is really established. All right. So that's the punishment here. He says, it's too great for me. And what's the Lord, what does the Lord do to him? He says, not so. Whoever kills Cain, uh, God will take care of him. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance yeah. shall well, be taken. God, God is saying it's not so. And then he says, but if it is, but if it does, it, it's kind of funny because um, not that he's contradicting, but he's taking both sides of, of it. Uh, that's not going to happen, but if it does. Well, if anyone kills Cain, that, that will be the punishment now. What does that mean sevenfold if, if someone kills Cain? Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. They'll have seven punishments instead of just one, right? Well, what would be the the one-to-one -one punishment is an eye for an eye, a life for a life. Sevenfold. Might be him and his children. Yeah. That's like, that's like your family now. You're talking. Oh. You kill. That's how. That's how it works with these battles. Oftentimes between tribes, it's like you have two warring tribes or two tribes that are living next to each other, and one a person from one tribe kills a person from another tribe. They then retaliate by killing the family of the guy who killed him, not just him, but his whole family. That tribe then retaliates by attacking the entire tribe. And it just escalates from there. Um, and so he says that that will be, but but the Lord will be the one to exact vengeance. And how will they know that this is the case? Um, He's going to put will, a mark on them, yeah. on, on Cain. The Lord puts a mark on Cain. So, uh, before you move on, one more time, sevenfold means uh, on his whole family. Well, sevenfold, you would say, is like it's, you know, it, someone would, if they stole something, they would have to pay back sevenfold. So if I stole one sheep, I'd have to pay back seven. So the idea of if anyone kills Cain, uh, then not just he will die, but sevenfold, there'll be seven that will perish uh, because of that. It's a, so in, other, in other words, people in his family. Probably, yeah. 
probably it would be it, it just multiplies the vengeance symbolic way of saying it just it will not be an equal equal weights it will be uh, multiplied the lord puts a seven, mark seven, on the name. yeah god seven is the number of god too right it is yeah it's a complete number of god yeah and we're going to get to this later on uh when you get to uh lamech who says if cain is avenged sevenfold then lamech shall be avenged seventyfold right and that that adds context to when Jesus asked about forgiveness. Remember? Seven How often? Times seven. Seven. <laughs> 70 times seven. 70 times seven, right? Which is the way that Lamech talked uh, about vengeance. Jesus talks about forgiveness. Putting it on his head. But this is the devil's brew here. Vengeance, bitterness, envy, pride, vengeance, bitterness, envy, pride, anger, frustration, the victim. We're going to get justice for ourselves. That's the devil's cock. The Lord puts a mark on Cain. Yeah. My, note, the, yeah. my, uh, my Bible has a, a note on the mark. Mm -hmm. It says probably a tattoo. The use of tattooing for tribal marks has always been common among the nomads of the near Eastern deserts. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably right. We don't know what exactly it was or where it was, but it, it communicates um that Cain will be avenged by the Lord in some way. So he makes a pu public mark in some way to, that communicates that that they would know what that means. Um, and so Cain would be protected in some way. And we don't know what it looked like. We don't know how he did it. Um, but just that God is showing some protection and mercy on him. And then it kind of concludes with the same way the fall of, you notice the flow of it? So similar to the Garden of Eden, the, the fall, right? You had the fall, the questioning, the curse, the punishment, yeah. and then even the mercy of the Lord providing some kind of protection for him, uh, covering them with garments of skin. And then the sending away. To the east. Yeah. East of Eden. To the east, um, away from the presence of the Lord. And keep keep in mind the east. That's that's the, always the direction when you want to go away from the presence of the Lord. Um, which is why New England is so miserable, right? With the most <laughs> of the country. To the east, away from the presence of the Lord. Okay. And that's where we're going to leave it off here today. Uh, we'll pick up with Cain next time, uh, the rest of his story. So any last comments or questions on this passage here? I guess it's not good to raise Cain. Yes, unless you're able, right? Then then you can <laughs> all right. Hang on.